Yes, modern feminism is a lot of talk, isn't it? Ooh, where sex and language get it on. Well, I am a sucker for good grammar, and sexy stuff would just be a bonus. Hey humans, I'm Amanda Montel, and this is The Dirty Word. Hi Amanda, I'm Scribelite, and this is... Um, well, I don't have a show name or anything. It's just my name. I guess that does seem a little self-centered. Today, I want to kind of bring it back to basics and talk about something that is still somehow quite controversial in English-speaking culture, and that is why we use the word feminism to talk about gender equality. You are quite correct, Amanda. Associating a word tied to a gender-specific social movement to a general notion of gender equality is inherently counterintuitive. The word we should be using when talking about social equalities, gender-based or otherwise, is egalitarianism. So, being that you're apparently focused on proper word choice, I look forward to you setting the record straight here. So I find that in the modern cultural dialogue, there tend to be two primary controversies surrounding this concept. The first being, if feminism is for everybody across the gender spectrum, including non-binary folks and men, if it's for the equality of all, then why is the word fem in the prefix? Why does this word seem to focus on femininity in particular? Um, fem is in the prefix of feminism, because it refers to a female-oriented social movement. That's why it's the incorrect word to use when referring to gender equality. So, uh, well, maybe this is just the warm-up towards arguing for egalitarianism? Sorry, I know I'm jumping the gun. Words just get me so excited. The other controversy comes from the modern commodification of feminism. I think we can all agree that feminism in recent years has enjoyed a bit of a renaissance. Renaissance. Now that is an interesting word. Obviously, we're not referring to the renaissance in the historical context, so we must be talking about definition four. A renewal of life, vigor, interest, etc., Rebirth, revival. Yes, third wave feminism is a rebirth of a kind, in that it has been rebranded as a social panacea, which it isn't. But we're getting to that, aren't we? But part of that modern renaissance has meant the trendification of feminism. So Nowadays, we live in this time where you might see the word feminism printed across a t-shirt or a hat at Forever 21 or Urban Outfitters. So that begs the question, is it okay for someone who maybe doesn't quite know what feminism in 2017 really means or maybe doesn't know where the word comes from to brand themselves with these labels? Um, wait a second. The question is, is it okay for someone to wear a feminism shirt if they don't understand what feminism means in the current year? I.e., is it okay for someone to consider themselves a feminist if they don't define feminism the way that you do? To address these topics, I want to go back and look at the history of where the word feminism comes from and some of the misconceptions that people have about it now. So the next time you interact with someone who takes issue with the term or isn't quite familiar with what it really means, you'll have this information at the ready. Alright, I am ready to be educated. 
tell me the history of the good word. So first, where does feminism come from? This term originated during the suffrage movement of the early 1900s. That's what we call first wave feminism. And politically, this primarily focused on getting women the right to vote. This was important, but it pretty much just benefited rich white ladies. Um, no. Black women were given the right to vote in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Now, some state and local rules, most prominently in the South, that stood as obstacles against black people voting did persist up until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So if that's what you meant, then you're correct. But the right to vote was attained by women, all women, in 1920. Over the past hundred years, feminism as a political concept has moved and is still moving to include more identities, women of color, queer women, women of different socioeconomic classes, disabled women. Um, feminism pertains to women, full stop. It hasn't evolved to include women who possess various other attributes. It pertained to women. What are you talking about? Even people along the gender spectrum, even dudes. All along the gender spectrum. The spectrum of two. And even dudes. Even. Well, how gracious of you. Since the mission of feminism, despite misconceptions, is to create gender equality, not female superiority. Really? So, anyone who calls themselves a feminist, who proclaims and advocates for the superiority of women, they just don't exist. And if they do exist, then they are not really feminists? Looking more specifically at the history of feminism will help us understand why that misconception exists. It's necessary to point out that over the years there have developed different sects of feminism. Different denominations, if you will. Indeed. Sects. Denominations. Feminism is a belief system, after all. And with so many interpretations of what true feminism is, how are we to believe that our speaker is professing the correct definition? During the era of second wave feminism in the 1960s and 70s, there developed something called liberal feminism. This focused on downplaying the differences between men and women in order to achieve political and social equality. No pay gap, reproductive rights, a place for women to exist in traditionally male arenas like government and the law. And now women have birth control and equal pay and opportunities so in line with men that they can compete to be president and end up on the Supreme Court if they work hard enough. Second wave feminism was a good thing, and it still is. The rest of the world could use a healthy dose of it. This ideology had good intentions, but... But it also sort of implied that women should adapt to male norms, which not everybody was cool with. Adapt to male norms. Well, how so? Do you mean like, if it is normal for a male firefighter to be able to carry 70 pounds of equipment, and be able to move with agility, and be able to carry another person out of harm's way in case of an emergency, should women not be required to match such a physical standard? I would be very curious to know our speaker's answer to that one. So then there was cultural feminism, which viewed women's ways of thinking, talking, and behaving as distinct and inherent and worthy of validation. Cultural feminism. I honestly can't say I have heard of that one before. But then, there are so many kinds of feminism. So, there are ways of thinking, talking, and behaving that are inherent and distinct 
and worthy of validation in women. All right. What ways of thinking are inherent to men, and are those not also worthy of validation? If so, why say feminism? There are two types of cultural feminism. There are two subtypes of the subtype. Can you not see that the more convoluted this becomes, the less credible it all seems? Liberal cultural feminism says that men and women are socialized to be different. One is not better than the other, they're simply different. Socialized to be different. How about that they are different on the basis that they are two different types of human beings on a biological level? And then there is radical cultural feminism. These were people who believed that a women-led or even a women-only society would be ideal. That women's ways of thinking, talking, and behaving were not equal but superior to men. Oh, so there are people who call themselves feminists who do believe in the superiority of women over men. Even though that's totally not the real definition of feminism, because there's only one way to define feminism, which is why there are different waves, different denominations, and different subcategories of those denominations. Go on. Unfortunately, a depressing number of folks confuse this ideology, which almost no one subscribes to, with just plain radical feminism. Not cultural radical feminism, just radical feminism. I get that the two can be easily confused, but they are different. The political right has, and I know this is an extreme word, but I'm going to use it, brainwashed, more or less, a lot of us into thinking that radical feminists are crazy, man-hating lunatics who think that men should be wiped from the face of the earth. The sex class in men is simply male privilege and gender identity, and it needs to be abolished if women are ever to be free. That is not what the phrase radical feminism means at all. Radical feminism is a school of thought that takes the word radical to mean from the root. In other words, they believe that gender inequality is the root cause of all social inequality. Gender inequality is the root cause of all social inequality. All. Okay, any bets on how soon we're going to be enlightened on intersectionality or intersectional feminism? This contrasts with material feminists who put the class struggle before the gender struggle, arguing that gender inequality has more to do with women's socioeconomic position in society rather than the fact that we fundamentally live in patriarchy. Material feminists put the class struggle before the gender struggle. Well, class isn't gender specific, so... Why do they even call themselves feminists? The feminisms that follow all of this are third wave, in that they welcome more identities into the conversation of feminism. W wait a second. The feminisms that follow all of that are third wave. All of those feminisms belong to the second wave? There are no radical feminists in the third wave? There's even more feminisms. This is otherwise known as intersectional feminism. Nailed it! And it recognizes that the oppressions of many different social groups, race, ethnicity, class, gender, are all connected. Distinct, but connected. Yes all connected into one vast conspiracy of overlapping oppressions that is so big and so complex that it can never be solved and will exist forever as a basis on which to proclaim victimhood. Got it. And that's the type of feminism that I subscribe to. 
the type that you subscribe to. So all of those other kinds of feminism, they are not to your liking? Well, why not? What makes them any less feminist than your feminism? Tell us why yours is the one true denomination. So I hope that little crash course in the evolution of feminism was helpful. But the next natural question that some people have is why we haven't changed the word feminism to something like equalism if the movement is supposed to be for everybody. <laughs> Redefining feminism to mean something that it's not? Surely you jest. Don't call me Shirley. And besides, as I said at the beginning of this video, we do not need a new word, because there already exists a word. It's called egalitarianism. And it doesn't have denominations, because it leaves no room for reinterpretation. The first problem with that is that changing the word would work to erase all the hard work that generations of women have done to fight for women's rights. You cannot change a word. You can only change its meaning. And there's no need to change the word because there is a word. But almost more importantly, the word feminism explicitly implies the movement's goal to remedy gender inequality and injustice, which definitely still exist in the world. The word feminism explicitly implies. Explicitly implies. Did CNN write this by any chance? A term like equalism is so unspecific that it doesn't imply any sort of movement or mission at all. Yeah, it's almost like such a broad notion would merely be an ethical standard on which you could test laws and policies against to work to aspire to. But that's just not specific enough. And personally, I just also have to wonder, if we're so opposed to the word feminism because the prefix fem is in it, what does that say about how we feel about femininity itself? Okay, I do not care about the prefix of the word any further than its root inherently contradicts the idea that it is meant to apply to everyone. This is why there is another word you should be looking for. Like, do we really hate femininity that much that we have to kick it out of this word that's been around for so long? I do not hate femininity. I hate bad grammar. I also hate authoritarians telling other people that to oppose the modern incarnation of feminism equates to hating women and hating femininity. I can speak for myself. Thank you. I know that sounds dramatic, but that's kind of how it feels to me. It feels to you. Got it. I guess my point in all of this is the following. Oh, there's a point to all of this? All right, lay it on me. Before wholesale rejecting the word feminism, or wanting to change it, or buying a shirt, or a hat, or a fanny pack, or a mug, or a frickin' mouse pad. Just because you think it's cute and the word is trendy, make sure you know what the word means. Have some respect for its origins and its evolution. Thank you all so much for watching this little history-centric episode of The Dirty Word. I hope you enjoyed it, and I would love to hear your thoughts on these topics, so if you have any comments or questions about the history of the word feminism, please leave them below. And remember, stay dirty. Well, I am glad that our speaker is open to thoughts and comments on her video. These have been mine. And again, I would highly recommend to our speaker who is both wanting to educate 
and celebrate the use of words and vocabulary to look up egalitarianism. Abiding by that principle isn't dirty, but it sure is sexy. As always, thank you for watching.